friends, welcome back to the channel. Happy New Year, all of that good stuff. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a junior doctor working in Cambridge. And in this video, I wanna talk about 15 life lessons that I learned in 2019. All of these are things that I've mentioned in some capacity or another in my weekly email newsletter. So pretty much any time I come across any interesting life lessons that I find useful, I share them in my email newsletter every Sunday. So you can sign up with the link down below. But yeah, here is a roundup of 15 of my favorite ones from 2019. Let's go. Firstly, I learned about the importance of setting a daily highlight. And I came across this in a book called Make Time by John Ziratsky and Jake Knapp. And they suggest that every day, like the way to be productive is to have a single daily highlight that you're gonna be working on for that day. So that's either something that's gonna bring you the most joy, something that's the most urgent, or something that will bring you the most kind of satisfaction when you do it. And I've started actively tracking this in the app Notion uh, for the last few months. And I find that on the days where I remember to set myself a daily highlight, I inevitably get more done that day, just because I then have this default activity that I know I'm gonna be doing. So that was a really important lesson that I learned. Secondly, we have a quote from Kurt Vonnegut, who's a famous writer, and he says, and I urge you to please notice when you are happy and exclaim or murmur or think at some point, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. And I first came across this kind of towards the end of 2019 and Kind of on reflection, I realized that I'm I'm very quick at moving from one thing to another thing to another thing. And I very rarely take the time to appreciate and kind of like enjoy the moment. And since I came across this quote, I've really started to actively do that more. Like, you know, let's say I'm driving in the car and I've got like a latte in my hand and I'm listening to something on Audible or whatever. Then, you know, I just occasionally have the thought that if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. Or let's say I'm on my desk and making a video or filming something or trying to learn something or running a supervision for my students. You know, I just like to think if this isn't nice, I don't know what is. And I just, it's, it's, it's that subtle encouragement for me to be more grateful for the things in my life. So yeah, thank you, Kurt Vonnegut, for that quote. Thirdly, I came across this idea of window openers versus door knockers. It's not quite the terminology they used in an episode of the My First Million podcast that I first heard this on, but I kind of synthesized what they were talking about and turned it into window openers and door knockers. And the idea is that in life, there are two sorts of people. There are the window openers and the door knockers. The window openers need to look through a window and when they see their expected outcome on the other side, then they open that window and they walk through. Whereas the door knockers are the sorts of people that will knock on lots of doors and open those doors and see what's on the other side. So like the key difference between those is for the door knockers, you don't know what's what the outcome of your action is going to be. You have to knock on the door and see. Whereas for the window openers, you see the outcome on the other side and you just kind of work through it to get it. And the point that they were making in this podcast that really resonated with me was that in most things in life these days, a lot of the success disproportionately comes from from the door knocker attitude rather than the window opener attitude. There are still some traditional careers like medicine and stuff whereby you know you have your path charted out in front of you and any action predictably leads to a certain outcome. But in all the rest of bits of life and you know a lot of business, a lot of creation, a lot like you know starting a YouTube channel, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. You just knock on the door, you apply consistency and hard work and dedication and all that good stuff. And you then gain the opportunity for serendipity that you never would have known was possible. Like, you know, if you'd asked me two and a half years ago, what's the point of starting a YouTube channel? I wouldn't have been able to articulate. I would have been like, oh, you know, it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to do it consistently and I hope someday it'll go well. And now it's completely changed my life. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I'd been a window opener, if I'd just been thinking, oh, you know, let me just focus on my medical career because that's the thing that I can see in front of me. Point number four is this idea by Derek Sivers, which is that what is obvious to you might be amazing to others. Now, whenever we're in any sort of like sharing of ideas, kind of field, content creation, this sort of stuff, making videos, writing blog posts, writing books, recording podcasts and stuff, we have this thing, like we all have this thing that, oh, you know, I'm not gonna share this idea because it's just kind of obvious. Surely everyone would know about it. You know, that this first lesson that I shared about the daily highlight, at this point, because I've I've incorporated it into my life, it's pretty obvious to me that, you know, if you wanna be more productive, you should set yourself a task to do each day. And if you don't, then, you know, what's the point? But that idea, when someone comes across it who hasn't heard it before, it's pretty revolutionary. And it's like, oh my God, that, that's incredible. Equally, for some of you watching this video, when I talked about, you know, if this isn't nice, I don't know what is, you might've been thinking, oh, come on, mate, that's obvious, everyone knows that. But when I first read it, I was like, oh my God, this is this idea has actually changed, changed the game for me because in, in, it's now made me more happier. It's encouraged me to, to feel more gratitude. So the point that Derek Sivers makes in this blog post, again, link in the video description, is that don't worry that what's obvious to you is gonna be obvious to others because it probably won't be. And so as a lesson to all of us, we can and should share the things that we've discovered, the things that we've learned, the 15 life lessons that we learned in 2019, because 
what's obvious to us might not be obvious to others. It might even be amazing to others. Point number five, uh, in 2019, I really began to appreciate the, the value of lifelong learning. So I recently became a physiology supervisor at Girton College, Cambridge University, where I teach 10 medical students every week about human physiology. And that's meant that I've actually had to learn all this stuff all over again and kind of explore it in more detail. And that's actually been really fun. It's been one of the most kind of joyful activities in my life, kind of sitting with, with the books and with the PDFs and papers and stuff and trying to figure out what the best way to teach this sort of topic is. And actually uh, the UK government, I found, uh, commissioned this like study, which was an analysis of all of the benefits of lifelong adult learning. Um, so, you know, people who learn stuff actively in their in their adult life. And there were all sorts of benefits. So they've said adult learning can indirectly improve well-being and lead to positive outcomes in health and socially positive attitudes and behaviors amongst like loads of other stuff. Uh, so yeah, I really began to appreciate the benefit of lifelong learning. And one other way that I've been trying to do this lifelong learning thing is by doing online courses on brilliant.org. And Brilliant is an amazing learning platform targeted at maths, science, and computer science. And they've got online classes from all sorts of things within those categories, like probability, number theory, algorithms, data structures, AI, neural networks, all this sort of stuff. I've personally enjoyed taking the computer science courses. Now, I actually considered applying for computer science rather than medicine, but I sort of reasoned at the time when I was 16 that it would kind of be cool to be a doctor who knows how to code rather than to just be a coder. But that meant that all of the coding that I've done has been sort of very hodgepodge and I've never quite taken the time to understand the fundamentals of algorithms, the fundamentals of how computer science work. And that's what I've been doing on Brilliant, which has been really helping on that front. They've also got this really cool new like daily challenges feature on Brilliant, whereby every day there is a new daily challenge and that introduces some concepts to you, whether it's math, science or computer science. And then it gives you a problem in which you have to kind of take that concept a little bit further and try and apply your new learning to it. And then they give you the solution and kind of explain it. And it's A, a really good way of just gen generally exercising the mind. And I find that it's also a good model for me to build my own teaching sessions around because the idea of tutorials and supervisions at universities like Oxford and Cambridge is that you would give the student a small amount of information. You kind of give them the basic building block and then you would ask them a question about it that kind of tests that a little bit more. And so it kind of takes it a little bit further and then we'll see, and then you see how far they can go and then add some more knowledge. And it becomes this iterative process whereby hopefully you kind of learn together and build on someone's understanding rather than by just kind of regurgitating something at them like I'm currently doing in this video. So that's one of the great things about the daily challenges feature in Brilliant. So if any of this sounds up your street and you wanna join this journey of lifelong learning to improve your physical, mental, social, and economic well-being, then please do sign up for free at brilliant.org forward slash Ali. And the first 200 people to use that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription and it's totally worth the price. So thank you very much Brilliant for sponsoring this video. All right, so point number six is this idea of a flywheel. Now, I first came across this in a Jim Collison interview on the Tim Ferriss show, I think. In engineering terms, a flywheel is like a device that stores mechanical rotational energy. But in terms of like business and creation and YouTube and entrepreneurship and all the stuff that I'm, I'm interested in outside of medicine, the, the idea of a flywheel is that it's, it's something that takes ages to get going, but when it gets going, then it kind of builds on itself and it's unstoppable. And people often use the flywheel analogy to describe how Amazon works. So for example, like they get really low prices and that leads to people wanting to buy stuff from Amazon, which leads to sellers wanting to go on Amazon, which means that Amazon then has this supply and demand thing, which means they can drive prices lower. And overall this like one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another on this flywheel that, you know, it takes a lot of effort to get going. Amazon's been going for years now, but then it becomes completely unstoppable because each thing kind of builds on itself. And the way that I've applied this flywheel concept to my life and I've started thinking about it is in terms of things like YouTube and podcast and making a blog in that like at the start when you're starting a YouTube channel, like, you know, you get basically no one viewing your videos and you might get one extra subscriber a day and you feel like super proud. Like, oh my God, I've gone from 47 to 48 subscribers in two days. That's incredible. Uh, and no one's watching your videos. But the more you can kind of produce hopefully valuable content consistently over a long period of time, the more the flywheel gathers momentum. And the weird thing about YouTube and the cool thing about YouTube is that the algorithm is very flywheely in that the more videos a YouTuber creates, the more opportunities there are for other people to discover their content, the more they're likely to subscribe, the more watch time they're gonna give, the more the algorithm benefits you and starts recommending your stuff in suggested videos. And it kind of drives this wheel that keeps on going and going and going. But the point is that it takes so much effort to get started initially. And anytime I'm, I'm sort of in that mode where I'm thinking, oh, this is too much effort, I think no. 
It's a flywheel. If I'm starting something new, then I know it's gonna take that effort to get started to begin with. Point number seven is I discovered this idea of mastering boring fundamentals. And I got this from a blog post by a guy called James Stuber, which was entitled Master Boring Fundamentals, Boring is Fun. I just wanna read a few things from it. So firstly, he says, for any endeavor, there are a set of basic skills needed to build a strong foundation. These are the boring fundamentals. Sleeping eight hours a night, exercising consistently, eating your vegetables, meditating, reading books, writing for yourself and for your peers. And then there are domain specific fundamentals like drilling guitar chords or calculus if you're into maths. He says that even when we know they're good for us, even when we know that they'll advance our goals, we avoid taking the steps needed. We don't do the boring fundamentals because, well, they're boring. Repetitive actions done day after day are not a recipe for excitement. There's a disconnect between the future positive result and the present slog. Progress often plateaus and only arrives in unpredictable bursts. And this sort of goes back to this idea of a flywheel in that we have to do these boring fundamentals. And he's kind of making a broader point about life, you know, sleeping eight hours a day, exercising, eating your vegetables. I don't even do these boring fundamentals. I don't sleep eight hours a day, even though I want to. I don't really eat vegetables because, you know, I'm just terrible at cooking and my diet is awful. And I don't really exercise consistently because I always feel like there's something better I could be doing. And the reason for that is because it's boring, it's a fundamental and the rewards don't come immediately. Whereas if I think, oh, I could go home and film a video, that results in a video and that it's like immediate gratification. Or as if I think, oh, do I wanna to go to the gym for two hours or do I wanna actively go to the shops and cook some vegetables to just improve my life in general? That, that's that got less of a an obvious, an obvious benefit. And so reading this kind of stuff reminds me that I need to master the boring fundamentals. And this is, you know, something that I've tried to actively think about more that sort of, sort of encouraged me to go to the gym a bit more and to eat a little bit more healthily and to really take care of my sleep. Point number eight is another idea that I found from James Stuber's blog. And that's the idea of type one versus type two fun. You know, when we think of fun, we often think that there's just the, the hedonism, the, the, the pure unadulterated joy type of fun that, oh, playing video games is fun or playing sports is fun. But for something like, you know, running a marathon or climbing a mountain or doing cross country skiing, we probably wouldn't consider that fun because it's not the same sort of fun. Uh, but in this blog post, he talks about this kind of long, long distance skier called Tim Peck, who defines a type two fun, which is where it's suffering in the present, but then it is sort of fun in hindsight. And that's a different sort of fun. And that is sort of the sort of fun that, uh, that I noticed that being a doctor when it's really, really busy is like, like it feels very grueling when you're there, but then at the end of the day, you look back and you think, oh, you know, that was actually a really good day. Um, it's definitely not pure hedonism when you're trying to kind of treat someone and there's emergencies going on and you're struggling to keep up with the workload, but it is definitely fun and it's a type two kind of fun. And so just understanding and like recognizing this distinction between type one and type two fun has been really helpful for me because now I have the vocabulary in my head to think about the sort of fun that is, you know, takes some suffering. Like I now appreciate why some people say that running is fun because previously I used to think how, how on earth can running be fun because it's not as fun as playing squash, but actually it's just a different sort of fun. So yeah. Point number nine is something I came across on the Tim Ferriss show. He interviewed a guy called Safi Bakal, I think. Can't remember his credentials. I think he wrote a book. Oh, maybe he wrote a book called Loom. Maybe that's it. We'll link it over there if that's the case and down below. This guy Safi is, is, is a writer uh, and he talks about how there are a few different uh, modes of writing. And the first one is FBR, which stands for fast, bad, wrong. Uh, and he says that when you're doing your first draft, just think to yourself, this is gonna be fast, it's gonna be bad, and it's gonna be wrong. And just having that mindset encourages us a lot more to actually just put stuff down on paper. And so for me, every time I'm writing my weekly email newsletter, I initially have that kind of writer's block where I'm like, oh, I don't know what to write because I don't know if this is gonna be good. But then, you know, for the last few months since I first came across this, I've been actively, you know, writing down FBR on top of the page just to remind myself, okay, this, this is just a first draft. It's gonna be fast, it's gonna be bad, it's gonna be wrong. And that means that I can just kind of write without worrying, without judging myself, without, without worrying about the quality. Inevitably, at the end of it, I've written something and then I come back to editing it and I think, oh, actually, this, this is kind of reasonable. Or if it's not, then I edit it. But it's a lot easier to edit once you've got a fast, bad, wrong thing than that thing that we as writers or as creators always try and do and try and get it right on the first draft. So just appreciating this and having this kind of vocabulary to define fast, bad, wrong has been really helpful for me and my writing career. And again, you know, plug to my weekly email newsletter, you can sign up with a link down below. Point number 10 is something that I came up with just completely made up one day for my weekly email newsletter, but I've started, I've started to apply it a lot more. And that is the write-off principle for productivity. For me, I kind of struggle with, it's it's not a bad struggle to have, but I kind of struggle with the, uh, with like uh, switching off. Like when I get home from work, let's say it's 9 p.m. I would think, oh, you know, I should, I've got two hours before bed. I should probably film a video, even if I'm really not feeling up to it, even if I'm feeling really tired and I know I'm not gonna do great work. I just think, you know what, I should film a video. 
and that's fine. Like, you know, consistency is important and all that stuff. Um, but there are a lot of days whereby I, I kind of procrastinate from filming the video, like at 9 p.m. after work, and I just kind of lie on my sofa just scrolling through Instagram. And I don't do anything, like I, I wouldn't get out a book and read it, or recently I wouldn't stop playing on my Nintendo Switch, because I would be feeling guilty about not making the YouTube video and not doing the work. Um, and so the idea behind the write-off principle is that sometimes it's okay to just write the whole day off, and once you've written the whole day off, you've decided that, you know what, I'm gonna give myself a break today, which means that at least for me, I find this helpful because then I don't have to feel guilty about not doing anything. Uh, and there was like, there was a day a few weeks ago where I was doing this, I was sort of sitting on the sofa behind there and my housemate Molly was sitting next to me and I was just like, oh Molly, I need to film a video but I can't be asked. And she was like, Ali, haven't you written something about the write-off principle? Why don't you just make it a write-off day? And I was like, oh my God, Molly, you're right. This can be a write-off day. And then it just like brought so much joy to my life that I didn't have to film a video that evening that I just kind of dropped my phone, got out my, my Nintendo Switch and played The Witcher 3 for like two hours, but it was two glorious hours and I wouldn't have ha had that joy <laughs> had I not kind of written the day off. So yeah, the write-off principle, if you wanna read more about it, I'll put a link to my email newsletter where I talked about it first, but. Yeah, that's point number 10. Point number 11, God, this video is getting really long. If you're still here, I apologize for being so rambly. I'll try and speed up. Point number 11 is the mundanity of excellence. And this comes from a paper that I read, um, which is from like the 1970s or 80s, or, you know, like old, old school, like boomer level territory, where the author talks about what defines excellence. And he studies the field of uh, swimmers. So he looks at competitive swimmers in like local club, national and Olympic levels and tries to figure out what's the difference between them. And he realizes that the difference between them, it's not a quantitative difference. It's not, it's not really that Michael Phelps practices that much more than someone who is a club or county level player. It's that the people who are at the really pro end of the excellent spe spectrum, they do things qualitatively differently. And the point he makes is that it's all just very mundane. Like they actively put a bit of effort into figuring out the technique. They wake up on time every day and do it. They look after their diet. There's nothing really sexy about the way that these people get really good at stuff. It's just that they just do the mundane repeatedly and just kind of do it consistently. And kind of reading this, like it, it's a really long paper, but I read the whole thing because it was a riveting read. Made me realize that we're always on the lookout for some kind of shortcut. You know, I fall into this myself. I'm, I'm guilty of this, you know, I, spreading the, the good news about the latest productivity app. But like really the latest productivity app probably isn't gonna make much difference to your life. What will make a difference to your life is just doing the boring fundamentals repeatedly and the point that this guy makes in this paper is that excellence is ultimately a mundane phenomenon. Like there's nothing sexy or exciting about it. It's all just very mundane. Like it's all just, you know, doing the right things consistently and trying to get a little bit better each time. Um, but I thought it was a very interesting read and a good lesson that I took away from it. Point number 12 is the go first rule. And I first came across that, I, I don't know where I came across this several years ago, but I've sort of ingrained it into my, my life. But it really stood out to me when I was in Sudan this time last year. When you go to a new place, like you probably know, there's always that kind of little bit of sort of meeting new people and needing to break the ice. And what I read in this book that I really can't remember where it's from is that everyone is friendly, but you have to be willing to go first. Because if you go first, if you take the initiative to say hello and you know introduce yourself and start, strike up a conversation, you will find that people are just generally nice and everyone's really friendly. And so in Sudan, you know, for a few minutes, I was like, oh, everyone's kind of shy, everyone's kind of quiet, I don't really know what to do. But then I started actively going up to people and kind of saying hello and just kind of generally having a chat. This going first that I did on my part, if I can say so, like I, I suddenly appreciated how, how friendly everyone was and people were like so happy to talk to me and it was just like, like really nice, a really, really good experience. And I think my experience in Sudan would have been a lot less fun had I not gone first uh, with, with those sorts of things. And I think this just applies generally across the board as well. Like, you know, when I'm at work, I try and go first in introducing myself to new colleagues in kind of initiating banter a bit when I can and inviting people to things. Just having like being able to take that fear of embarrassment and internalize it within ourselves and just forget about it and just go first means that we see just how amazing humanity is. This sounds really corny. How amazing humanity is, how friendly people are and how willing people are to connect as long as we go first. Point number 13, high leverage housekeeping. This is an idea that my brother came up with and which is that every Saturday what he does is that instead of doing active work on his, his thing, he does what he calls high leverage housekeeping, which is that kind of sorting out the email inbox, sorting out the to-do list, you know, cleaning the desk, uh, sorting out like, you know, the project uh, management software. I think he uses Notion to manage to track his own startup and figuring out what needs to be done. But just spending a few hours on a Saturday to just get get your life in order. Sort of like what Amazon used to do. And like, like, apparently there was one year just before they hit a billion in revenue where the, the mantra for the whole year was go Gohio, G-O-H-I-O, getting our house in order. 
And the point for the whole year was to kind of focus on the systems and make everything work really well, not try and create new things. And so what I try and do now is that every now and then, I try, I try and do this weekly, but it ends up not being weekly. I think about, you know, having a whole day dedicated to high leverage housekeeping, where I can do things like like, like make decisions about where I, or like what I wanna be doing for the next weeks or the next month or sort of actively planning new video ideas. Whereas otherwise I'm just in kind of technician mode. I'm just kind of doing the thing. I never really take the time to step back and figure out where I can apply leverage, where I can do some housekeeping to make things scale better, grow better, be more fun, that sort of stuff. So high leverage housekeeping, again, link to all of these in my email newsletter if you wanna have a read uh, in more detail. Point number 14 is this idea of having an inbox for your brain. And this is from uh, David Allen's book, Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity, uh, which is just kind of like the Bible for productivity about how to get stuff done. But like the main thing I take away from this is that it's really important to have an inbox for your brain, basically, a place where you can capture ideas and things like as soon as they hit your brain so that you can then offload them from your brain into this inbox. So these days I use the app Drafts for that. So anytime I have an idea for a video or a quote or literally anything I'm thinking of, either on my Apple Watch or on my phone or on my Mac, I will open up the Drafts app and just write, write a quick note for that. And that means that when I'm doing my high leverage housekeeping and my weekly reviews or whatever, then I can convert the draft items either into Notion projects or into Todoist items if they need to be done urgently, or I can just kind of file them away in my archives. And it's nice having this inbox for my brain because it means that my brain is then for having ideas, not for storing them. And that's the idea that David Allen talks about in his book, Getting Things Done. Again, link in the video description. And finally, point number 15 is the power of project lists. So again, I only, st I only really started doing this after reading Getting Things Done like for the third time. And the idea is that you should have a list of all of the projects that you're currently working on and that you want to be working on. So like after reading this in, in the app Notion, I made like a project list of all the videos that I, all the video ideas that I might have and all the videos that I was currently working on. And just the fact that I had all of that stuff written down meant that my brain was doing this like background processing of these various projects as I was going about my day and just like not even realizing it or even maybe when I was asleep. So like sometimes I genuinely like, like wake up in the morning and I'd be like, oh, that idea for a video that I had ages ago that I wrote down on this project list, I've just thought about something to make that happen. Or if I'm driving to work in the car and listening to an audiobook or listening to a podcast, occasionally I just have an idea that references some of the, some of the projects that I've got on my list. And I, I didn't really have that before I started writing this sort of stuff down. And so I'm a real big believer of having a list of projects that we're working on. And that's not even in the video front, it's just kind of in life in general. And the way that David Allen defines that is as is that a project is anything that has more than one step required to do it. So now I've got like a whole list of projects that I'm working on and I find that that's really helpful. And that's been the final lesson that I learned in 2019. So that was a roundup of all the things that I learned in 2019. In fact, it wasn't all of them, it was like 15. Um, pretty much all of them I write in my weekly email newsletter. So for all 52 of them, check out email.oliabdal.com, link in the video description. You can have a look at my weekly email newsletter. You can subscribe if you like, but that is where I share all of the things in real time as I discover them. But I thought I'd do this annual roundup just because a few weeks ago I was making my annual review video and I thought, oh, you know, this is a list of 15 things that I've like, life lessons I've learned this year. Why don't I just make it into a video? So that was kind of where the idea came from. Yeah, thanks for watching. If you like this video, I'll put another links to here of another playlist that has similar sort of life lessons, life advice -y sort of stuff. Um, if you like this whole lifelong learning thing like I do, then please do sign up to brilliant.org forward slash Ali. That also really helps support the channel. So if you like this video, consider signing up for a free trial of that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.